We welcome you to our Bible study today on the subject of the Apostolic Doctrine of Eschatology. Today, our Bible study is going to be about the subject of audience relevance. Audience relevance is the key factor in knowing what the Scriptures say and what they mean when they say it and to whom it is said. It is about the time then when it was spoken by the Lord and not about some far future uh, distant time. Futurism is a distortion of prophetic fulfillment which is so prevalent in churches today. Audience relevance when applied to, to the people, the places, and events in their proper hermeneutical context is very understandable and very believable. Hermeneutics is the common sense interpretation of scriptures. The who, what, when, where, and why as applied to an audience. In this case, the audience of Jesus and the apostles is a living first century Bible audience. The phrase in these last days in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says this, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, it's obviously the precursor to the phrase last day as used in John chapter 6 verse 39, 40, 45, and 54. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And in John chapter 11 and verse 24, Martha, Lazarus' sister, made note of the fact it was the last day that the resurrection was going to place, take place. This is referring to none other than the day of the Lord. Martha said unto him, I know... He shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews was making his hearers aware of the necessity of encouraging one another. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Bible said this, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Now why would the writer of Hebrews warn those people of the approaching day of the Lord if the day of the Lord was not to come for 2,000 years and counting? This day of the Lord was none other than the fearful and tremendous day of the Lord, the season for the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and the nation of the Jews. The last days of Hebrews chapter 1 and the last day of Hebrews chapter 10.25 are irrefutably the same. The two chapters defend the imminence of the coming of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 57 the Bible said this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall it put on incorruption, and this mortal shall it put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is none other than the day of resurrection that occurred on the last day of the last days in the year A.D. 70 of the first century. The Apostle Paul's language is such that it could not be interpreted any other way by those who had received this epistle. He says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. These were comforting words to believers about the events that were getting ready to take place in their lifetime. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, Peter said this, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Peter proclaimed that the time had come. Peter makes it very clear who his audience is. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter included himself in God's promise of salvation when he said, The Lord is long-suffering to usward. His use of the term usward puts this verse in its proper setting and identified his proper audience, those who were alive and standing alongside Peter in the first century church. The day of the Lord and the return of Jesus were some of the things which pertain to a then living audience. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It was the knowledge, instruction, and information about events ready to occur in that generation. These events were described by the apostles as being at hand. Let's look back at some of the other biblical examples of obvious audience relevance. For example, in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 13 through 17, the scripture said this, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. God gave to Noah information about a coming event that was going to happen in his lifetime. He also gave him the knowledge and instructions about building an ark which would be his way of escaping this coming judgment on the wickedness of man. It is very clear that Noah and his family were the only audience that God was speaking to. Because of Noah's obedience to the word of God, he and his family were saved from the judgment of God upon that generation. Obviously, when we read about the account of Noah and the flood in our Bibles today, 
We don't start building an ark in our backyard because we know who God's audience was then. <clears throat> we are properly applying the concept of audience relevance. Another example of audience relevance was when the Israelites were in Egyptian bondage. God gave Moses instruction to apply the blood of a lamb to the two side doorposts and the upper doorposts of all the houses of the Israelites in order to escape the last plague, the death of the firstborn. This was the judgment of God against Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 and 7 and 12 and 13. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers. A lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. And you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. When we read about this account in our Bibles today, we understand that these instructions were for the Israelites on the eve of their deliverance from Egypt. We do not wipe the blood of a lamb on our doorposts today because we know that these instructions were obviously not for us today. Again, we have applied the concept of audience relevance. Another example of audience relevance is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 13 where God revealed to the prophet Isaiah what his judgment was for Babylon by the Medes. In Isaiah chapter 13 1, 3, 5, 10, and 11, 13, 15, 17, the Bible says this. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. And everyone that is found shall be thrust through, and everyone that is joined out of them shall fall by the sword. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It is apocalyptic language 
that was used here to reveal God's judgment on the kingdom of Babylon. When we apply the concept of audience relevance to this passage describing the destruction of Babylon, it is very clear that God's judgment was being described against the kingdom of Babylon. The Babylonian kingdom was destroyed shortly after the prophet Isaiah prophesied about it. Notice that the planet was not destroyed. The physical sun and moon did not stop giving their light, but God's judgment did come swiftly and completely against the Babylonian world. It was the same apocalyptic language used in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29, the Bible stated this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This was the apocalyptic language of gloom and doom, the judgment of God that was coming against the nation of the Jews. Notice in Revelation chapter 5 verses 12 through 17, it's describing the judgment of God on the 12 tribes of Israel from 66 to A.D. 70 in the first century. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall abide to stand? This was the language of the arrival of God's judgment on Israel for breaking his covenant, as it says in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Just as the physical planet earth with all of its constellations did not pass away at the time of the destruction of Babylon, likewise the planet did not pass away at the destruction of Israel and its temple. So why are so many churches today and believers today waiting for the physical planet, the sun, the moon, the stars, to all be destroyed sometime in our future? It is because the concept of audience relevance is not being applied to these scriptures found in the New Testament. Please refer to the Bible study on apocalyptic language that you have on your YouTube for many more examples of this same language being used and a more in-depth look at the subject of apocalyptic language. The last book in the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. This book was an indictment against the priesthood. Malachi chapter 1 verses 6 and 8, chapter 2 verses 1, 2 and 8, and chapter 3 verses 8, 9, and verse 13 and 14. A son honored his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? 
Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, Wherein have ye we polluted thee? And that you say, The table of, of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I've cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? It was the priesthood of the Old Testament that was robbing God. The whole book of Malachi is about the indictment against those priests. When we apply the concept of audience relevance, it is so easy to see that these were things said to and of the priest of the Old Covenant and not to anyone in the New Testament. It was only relevant to people who were under the law. As we continue to apply the concept of audience relevance throughout the Bible, we can easily see that the first century Christians understood the following prophecies were to them and for them and would be fulfilled in their lifetime. For example, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Everything that was written in Scripture found its fulfillment in that first century, those days of vengeance. And in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. It was the audience that Jesus was speaking to and of in the first century that would not pass away. Notice in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. The time of fulfillment of Scripture was at hand in the first century. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 what the scripture said. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The ends of that age was there and had come. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5 the scripture said this, Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. This was a letter that was written to the church at Philippi, admonishing them, telling them that the Lord, the coming of the Lord was at hand 2,000 years ago in the first century. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15, 16, and 17, <clears throat> the Bible said this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have several lessons on the resurrection that are on the YouTube. You can look at these. Much is being said about the resurrection that happened on the last day. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4, the Bible said this, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Audience relevance makes it very clear to whom he was speaking to about what was getting ready to take place. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, the Bible stated this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, the Bible stated this, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And will not tarry. How often have we heard the expression that's used in many churches today, if the Lord tarries, we'll do this or we'll do that. The scripture very plainly states, He will not tarry. He did what He, was said, he said He was going to do, and He did it when He said He was going to do it. And that occurred in the first century, 2,000 years ago. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible stated this, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. There again, audience relevance was simply stating that the coming of the Lord was there, drawing nigh. In 1 Peter, chapter 4, and verse 17, the scripture said this, For the time is come, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? Many times it's said in churches today that judgment begins at the house of God. And they never mention the first few words of that scripture that says simply, For the time is come, present tense, 2,000 years ago, Peter wrote that. Remember, when we read all of these scriptures, we must continue to apply the concept of audience relevance. The phrase last days is used several times in the New Testament to convey to the readers the nearness of the coming of the Lord and the end of the old covenant age. The last days spoken of in the New Testament are the same as the last days spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. In the book of Acts, the people who were present there on the day of Pentecost could hardly think that there would be 2,000 years of last days before that great and notable day of the Lord's coming. This is obviously a futuristic distortion of time in comparison to the Apostle Peter's presentation of prophetic fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. Again, the futuristic position simply refuses to apply the concept of audience relevance to these New Testament references to the last days. Peter's audience was very familiar with the prophet Joel's prophecy regarding the coming of the Lord. His audience understood that if these things were being fulfilled in their lifetime, then the day of the Lord and all the events mentioned by the prophet Joel would soon take place in their lifetime. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 31 said this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord 
come. All of this is apocalyptic language. Notice in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. And this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour it on my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. These two scriptures in Joel and the book of Acts confirm that the events would transpire before the great and notable day of the Lord. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, Jesus made reference to this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah. Notice in Matthew chapter 11 verses 13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. In the book of Luke, chapter 20, in verse 45, the scripture said that Jesus spoke to his audience. Then, in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples. The audience that Jesus spoke to was alive 2,000 years ago. There are many examples in the scriptures that prove what was said to the believers in the first century involved the events that were getting ready to take place in their immediate lifetime. They were never intended to happen in our time today. It was the last days of God's old covenant relationship with Israel, her land, city, temple, and religion. In AD 70, Jesus returned. There was a resurrection of all the dead and a catching away of all living Christians, just like Jesus and his disciples taught and propagated. It was the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's judgment. The book of Revelation has been completely fulfilled. We now live beyond the end times under the new covenant. There are no last days or end of this covenant. The new covenant is an everlasting covenant. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37 and verse 26, the scripture says this, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Notice what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 says. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus is here now reigning in his spiritual kingdom. Spiritual death has been defeated. You must be born again to the scriptures. You must be born again of the gospel of Jesus Christ if you want to be a part of this everlasting kingdom. In John chapter 3 verses 3 through 5, the scripture said this, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he could not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the king into the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 8 and verse 51, the reference is made to the Pentecostal experience here. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And in John chapter 11 and verse 26, the Bible said this, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In conclusion, when the concept of audience relevance is applied throughout the Word of God, the Scriptures all fall right into place. There are no gaps, no delays, no futuristic end-time scenario, no fearful feelings of impending gloom hanging over our heads anymore. When we understand and apply the concept of audience relevance, it is so clear that the people who were alive in the first century church were looking forward to the return of Jesus and the establishment of His eternal kingdom in their lifetime, and they saw it. Any question, any comment that you'd like to make, you can email us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. I know.